Now, with the help of this diagram, we are going to understand the different kinds of cells and their location. So, if you see over here, what is this? This is an osteoid. This is an osteoid. Okay. On the surface of the osteoid, you are seeing certain cells. Okay. These cells, they are called as the osteoblast. Okay. Let me just show you over here. Now, over here again, this is the osteoid. And over here on the surface of the osteoid, you are having certain cells. These are the osteoblast number one. Okay. The number one cell. Now the second cell, now after the osteoblast, they have performed their function. They are going to get embedded within the osteoid matrix over here. So these are all the osteocytes. So osteocytes are those osteoblasts which has become quiescent and they have performed their function and they have translocated from the surface and they have got embedded within the bone matrix. Okay, so these are the osteo. Uh, aside, this, this is the second important group of cell. The third important group of cell, they are the osteoclast as we can appreciate. These are basically multinucleated macrophages which are specialized resident macrophages which carry out bone resorption. So these are the three important classes of cells, the osteoblast, the osteocytes and the osteoclast. Okay. Now let us look at this particular histological image. Now this is a histological image of a cortical bone or a compact bone. Now, what we can appreciate over here, one very important thing that we can appreciate. So, this is the basic organization. So, if you can appreciate, we have certain round structures in this compact bone. This compact bone is nothing but the outer hard part okay, of the bone, which is providing structural rigidity. So, basically, you can see this individual unit is called as osteon. It is called as osteon. So the cortical bone or the compact bone, they are comprising the concentric layer or concentric lamella. So we are seeing round, round concentric lamella over here. Very important. At the center, at the center, if you see at the center of this osteon or the, uh, at the center of this concentric lamella, you are having the Havertian canal and over here, the blood supply is coming. Okay, the blood supply is coming over here. Now, this osteon or this concentric lamella, if you see, is comprising certain lacunae which is containing osteocyte. Okay, so there is osteocytic lacunae that we can appreciate in this diagram. Okay, now, now this is this is again this is another osteon, again this is another osteon, again this is another osteon. In between the osteon, you are having another kind of lamellae that is called as interstitial lamellar bone, interstitial lamellar bone. So this is the basic what we are discussing. We are discussing mainly the cortical bone, which is the outer hard structure, which is providing structural, uh, uh, you know, uh, support to the bone. And mainly they are uh, histologically, they are comprising concentric lamellae of bone surrounding the Havertian canal and they contain the lacunae containing the osteocyte. So osteocytic lacunae is there and in between the osteoid, we are having the interstitial lamellae as we can appreciate in this particular diagram. Of diagram, I am now going to show you the different kinds of fracture. So first of all, this is a fracture. We can appreciate a fracture over here, but the ends of the bone where the fracture is there, that is not displaced. So it is a non-displaced fracture. Whereas over here, the ends of the fracture ends has been displaced. So it is called as a displaced fracture. Again, over here, if you see the bone fragment has pierced the skin and come out. So it becomes a compound fracture. Again, now what is the green stick fracture wherein the fracture line has not completely traversed the bone. So you can see a partial fracture over here. This is a green stick fracture, which is classically seen in infants having soft bones. Transverse fracture when completely there's a transverse breakage that we can appreciate when the bone is basically broken down into many pieces. Spiral fracture, uh, uh, spiral fracture, if you see, when this uh, bone has completely broken and it has also rotated, we will call it as a spiral fracture. And again, compound fracture, when they are communicating with the outside skin, we are using the term compound fracture. Okay. Myself, Dr. Gibran Ahmad presents to you Simply Pathology and today we are back with a very important lecture. Today we are going to discuss a very important long answer question that is asked in the exam that is fracture healing. So let us begin today's topic of discussion. Now, one very important thing before we start to understand the healing process in the bones, that is the fracture healing, we have to understand the basic anatomy of the bone. And I would suggest it is the basic relevant anatomy of the bone, that much anatomy that is required for understanding the process of fracture healing. Now, the adult human beings or the adult human skeleton is comprising 206 bones, which is constituting 12% of the body weight. So what is the function of the bone? The bone is providing a mechanical support. It is also facilitating transmission of force. It is providing protection to the internal organs. 
also playing a very important role in mineral homeostasis mainly the calcium and phosphorus homeostasis and it is the major site of hematopoiesis in the postnatal life now if you see a bone is having two important components okay one is the bone matrix another one is your cells okay so let us try and understand one important thing over here that what is the bone matrix comprising of the bone matrix is made out of of osteoid which is constituting 35 percent of the bone and minerals which is constituting 65 percent of the bone matrix now out of all the minerals uh, the most important constituent of the mineral is calcium hydroxy apatite now this formula is again very important from your mcq point of view calcium 10 phosphate 6 uh, and hydroxide o2 okay now this calcium hydroxy apatite it is very important for providing hardness to the bone it is also serving as a storage site for 99 percent of the calcium and 85 percent of the phosphorus in the body so 99 percent calcium and 85 percent of phosphorus in the body is basically stored uh, in the form of calcium hydroxy apatite okay coming to the osteoid part now the osteoid basically is comprising of type 1 collagen which is the most important component of the osteoid along with that they also contain some amount of glycosaminoglycans and other proteins now among the other proteins you are going to see one important protein is your osteopontin also known as osteocalcin and this is mainly produced by the osteoblast so osteopontin or osteocalcin they are produced by the osteoblast and very importantly they are involved in the regulation of bone formation bone mineralization as well as calcium homeostasis so serum osteopontin if you see it is also one of the serum markers of osteoblast activity there are many markers of osteoblastic activity but serum osteopontin is also one of the serum marker of osteoblast activity so now if we are going to see when we look at a bone okay when you look at a bone bones can be of two types it can there can be a woven bone or there can be a lamellar bone so what is the difference between a woven bone and the lamellar bone woven bone is basically immature and they are rapidly produced okay they show haphazard arrangement of collagen fiber and they have an increased number of closely packed osteocytes and they are mainly seen in the fetal life and during the process of fracture healing it is abnormal to find woven bone in normal adults okay now if you look at the lamellar bone lamellar bone usually replaces the woven bone and they have a more organized parallel arrangement of collagen fiber compared to the haphazard arrangement of the woven bone and the amount of osteocytes they are far more smaller and they are less numerous osteocytes as you compare with the woven bone so let me show you what a woven bone or a lamellar bone how they look like so let me show you with the help of a diagram so this particular diagram if you see on the left hand side we can see a classic woven bone okay if you see there is a classic woven bone so you can see haphazard arrangement of collagen fibers if you see it is quite haphazard so the collagen fiber arrangement is quite haphazard in case of woven bone whereas on the right hand side we are having your classical well organized mature lamellar bone okay if you look at the lamellar bone you can see that the collagen fibers they are arranged mainly in the form of you know parallel bundle so there is a parallel bundling over here so they are more organized appearance okay the second important point of difference if you see the woven bone they contain it is more cellular and they contain more osteocytes what are osteocytes i will tell you if you can see these these structures they are the osteocytes so the amount of osteocytes they are more and they are larger as compared to the lamellar bone whereas osteocytes they are also present over here but they are smaller and they are uh, you know uh, 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 not as cellular as they are seen in case of woven bone so this is the concept of woven bone and lamellar bone normal adult bone we are comprising lamellar bone mainly woven bone is only seen during the fetal development or during the process of fracture healing okay so right now what we have read we have seen that the basic anatomy the bone is comprising of a matrix and the bone is comprising of certain cells okay certain cells like the osteoblast osteocyte and the osteoclast among the bone matrix if you see we have two components one is the osteoid one is the minerals okay so in the minerals which is constituting 65 percent of the bone matrix we are mainly having calcium hydroxy apatite this is the main formula and they are responsible for the hardness of the bone as well as they are they are acting as a storage site for 99 percent of body calcium and 85 percent of body phosphorus 
the remaining 35 percent of the bone matrix is the osteoid which is mainly comprising of type 1 collagen with some amount of glycosaminoglycans and other important proteins one of which is osteopontin or osteocalcin which is important marker of osteoblast activity then we had seen that the bone can be of two types okay we can see there are there are two types of bone one is the woven and the lamellar bone with the help of diagram we have already seen how a woven bone looks like as compared to a lamellar bone now let us see there is one more kind of you know division of a bone a bone can again be divided as a cortical or compact bone which is forming 80 percent of the bone or the second part is the trabecular or cancellous bone which is forming 20 percent of the bone now the cortical or the compact bone they are basically forming the dense outer shell and they are responsible for providing structural rigidity whereas the trabecular or the cancellous bone if you see they basically you know they are traversing the marrow space and they are involved mainly in the mineral homeostasis so if you look at this particular diagram we can appreciate this is a long bone as you can appreciate in this diagram this is a long bone so as we said that bone can be of two types structurally so on the outer aspect we are having a dense outer cortical bone also called, called as compact bone okay compact bone whereas on the inner aspect we are having trabecular or cancellous bone okay this is forming 80 percent of the bone mass and structure they are providing structural rigidity whereas the cancellous bone mainly responsible for mineral homeostasis and they are constituting 20 percent of the bone and they are also called as trabecular bone trabecular bone okay now let us look at this particular histological image now this is a histological image of a cortical bone or a compact bone now what we can appreciate over here one very important thing that we can appreciate so this is the basic organization so if you can appreciate we have certain round structures in this compact bone this compact bone is nothing but the outer hard part okay of the bone which is providing structural rigidity so basically you can see this individual unit is called as osteon it is called as osteon so the cortical bone or the compact bone they are comprising the concentric layer or concentric lamella so we are seeing round round concentric lamella over here very important at the center at the center if you see at the center of this osteon or the uh, at the center of this concentric lamellae you are having the haversian canal and over here the blood supply is coming okay the blood supply is coming over here now this osteon or this concentric lamellae if you see is comprising certain lacunae which is containing osteocyte okay so there is osteocytic lacunae that we can appreciate in this diagram okay now now this is uh, this is again this is another osteon again this is another osteon again this is another osteon in between the osteon you are having another kind of lamellae that is called as interstitial lamellar bone interstitial lamina bone so this is the basic what we are discussing we are discussing mainly the cortical bone which is the outer hard structure which is providing structural uh, uh, you know uh, support to the bone and mainly they are uh, histologically they are comprising concentric lamellae of bone surrounding the haversian canal and they contain the lacunae containing the osteocytes so osteocytic lacunae is there and in between the osteon we are having the interstitial lamellae as we can appreciate in this particular diagram now we are going to see the uh, uh, the trabecular bone or the cancellous bone so we are seeing, going to see the concept of trabecular bone or cancellous bone so this is basically the central part of the bone so we are basically discussing this area okay we are discussing the cancellous bone which is forming 20 percent of the entire bone in the body so this is the cancellous bone if you see if we take the histological image so what is happening that we are having the bony trabeculi we are having the bony trabeculi as we can appreciate and in between the bony trabeculi we have the marrow space containing the bone marrow so this is the marrow space over here okay this is the classical trabecular or the cancellous bone so i hope the concept is clear what is a cortical bone what is a cancellous bone histologically what do they look like okay again the concept I, I hope the concept of woven and lamellar bone is also clear to you people okay what is the woven bone what is the lamellar bone is should be very clear woven bone it is the immature bone 
it is the immature bone whereas the lamellar bone if you see it is the mature bone it is the mature bone okay so we have seen different things over here we have seen that the bone is made up of matrix and the cells we have discussed the matrix in details then we have seen that the bone can be of two types woven bone lamellar bone again individual bone or long bones they can be divided into cortical uh, or compact bone and inner trabecular or cancellous bone and this is the histology that we have discussed in detail now coming to the other part of the bone so one we have discussed the bone matrix wherein we have seen the osteoid and we have also discussed about the minerals now very importantly we are going to discuss about the different cells which are present in the bone and what are their function so we are going to start with the osteoblast so the osteoblast if you see as the term suggests they are basically present on the surface of the osteoid matrix so on the surface of this osteoid matrix you are having the osteoblast what is the main function of the osteoblast they will synthesize bone matrix and they regulate mineralization now increased serum bone related alkaline phosphatase is also reflective of osteoblastic activity in addition to osteopontin that we have seen now the second type of cell that is the osteocyte now what are osteocyte now those osteoblasts which have already performed their function okay they get embedded within the bone matrix and they are called as osteocytes so osteocytes are nothing but the quiescent osteoblasts that has performed its function and which gets embedded in the bone matrix that is called as the osteocyte now osteocytes helps to distinguish between the woven and the lamellar bone we have seen that in case of woven bone they are highly cellular and they are larger whereas in lamellar bone they are quite organized and they are fewer in amount and they are smaller in size the major function of the osteocyte is to it helps control the calcium and phosphate levels it also helps to detect the mechanical forces and convert the mechanical forces into biological activity this is called as mechanotransduction which is the major function of the osteocytes and lastly we are having the osteoclast osteoclast are nothing but these are specialized resident macrophages okay they are multi nucleated resident macrophages so the specialized resident macrophages in the bone they are called as osteoclast and they are multi nucleated their major function is bone resorption they are basically seen in the endosteal surface of the cortical or the compact bone and the trabeculae of the trabecular bone so what does it mean for example they can be seen over here osteoclasts can can be seen over here in case of trabecular bone whereas in case of compact bone they are seen on the endosteal surface now this is the endosteal surface of the compact bone endosteal surface so in this endosteal area you can see basically in the endosteal area of the cortical bone you can find the osteoclast okay or in case of cancellous bone you can see in the trabeculae as well now most importantly the serum acid phosphatase okay the serum acid phosphatase is indicative of osteoclastic activity just like the uh, uh, serum alkaline phosphatase is uh, indicative of osteoblastic activity now remember the osteoclasts they secrete a number of acid and neutral proteases mainly matrix metalloproteases and basically it is the secretion of these uh, proteases or these enzymes that is dissolving uh, the uh, 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 the organic and the inorganic components of the bone and, and and they are helping in the process of bone resorption now with the help of this diagram we are going to understand the different kinds of cells and their location so if you see over here what is this this is a osteoid this is an osteoid okay on the surface of the osteoid you are seeing certain cells okay these cells they are called as the osteoblast okay let me just show you over here now over here again this is the osteoid and over here on the surface of the osteoid you are having certain cells these are the osteoblast number 1 okay the number 1 cell now the second cell now after the osteoblast they have performed their function they are going to get embedded within the osteoid matrix over here so these are all the osteocytes so osteocytes are those osteoblast which has become quiescent and they have performed their function and they have translocated from the surface and they have got embedded within the bone matrix okay so these are the osteo uh, a side this, this is the second important group of cell the third important group of cell they are the osteoclast as we can appreciate these are basically multi nucleated macrophages which are specialized resident macrophages which carry out bone resorption so these are the three important classes of cells the osteoblast the osteocytes and the osteoclast okay 
Now this is another image again this is the osteoid matrix over here as we can appreciate over here the osteoid matrix and on the surface we are basically having the active osteoblast whose major function is synthesis of the osteoid matrix. So these are the osteoid uh, the osteoblast okay very very important and on the right hand side of this image we can see these giant uh, uh, cells containing multiple nuclei. So these are the osteoclast these are the osteoclast okay. And what is the major function of osteoclast it is basically bone resorption. So they are multinucleated giant cells. These are bone specific resident tissue macrophage called as osteoclast inside the bone. Now, with this background or uh, with this uh, concept in our mind, now we are going to understand the process of fracture healing. So, now you know what is a cortical bone. Now, you know what is a trabecular or cancellous bone. Now, you know what is the meaning of bony matrix. What is the uh, what is an osteoid. Now, you understand the meaning of a woven bone and the, the, the meaning of a lamellar bone. So, with this uh, concept in our mind, we are going to understand the concept of fracture healing, which is a very important long answer question, which is asked in the exam in second MBBS as well as in the post graduation. Okay. So, what is a fracture? Fracture is mainly defined as a loss of bone integrity. Now, there are different kinds of fracture depending on you know uh, uh, the type of fracture. So, fracture can be traumatic. Traumatic fracture is that when it is occurring in a normal bone due to trauma or it can happen even in the absence of trauma that is called as a pathological fracture. This occurs basically in a diseased bone or an abnormal bone. Again, any kind of fracture where the overlying skin is intact, that is called as a simple fracture. And when the overlying skin is basically uh, is not intact, when the bone communicates with the skin surface, then we are using the term compound fracture. If, for example, if you look at a fracture wherein the bone has basically, uh, you, you know, the bone has uh, basically been pulverized into small bits and fragments. In that case, we are calling it as comminuted fracture when the bone is fragmented. Displaced fracture is when the ends of the bone at the fracture side, they are not aligned with each other, then we call it as a displaced fracture. What is a stress fracture? This is a slowly developing fracture following periods of increased physical activity. Then there is a green stick fracture. Green stick fracture is a type of fracture which is extending only partially through the bone and it is commonly seen in infants when the bones are quite soft. So with the help of diagram, I am now going to show you the different kinds of fracture. So first of all, this is a fracture. We can appreciate a fracture over here, but the ends of the bone where the fracture is there, that is not displaced. So it is a non-displaced fracture. Whereas over here, the ends of the fracture ends has been displaced. So it is called as a displaced fracture. Again, over here, if you see the bone fragment has pierced the skin and come out. So it becomes a compound fracture. Again, now what is the green stick fracture wherein the fracture line has not completely traversed the bone. So you can see a partial fracture over here. This is a green stick fracture which is classically seen in infants having soft bones. Transverse fracture when completely there is a transverse breakage that we can appreciate. Communicated when the bone is basically broken down into many pieces. Spiral fracture, uh, uh, spiral fracture if you see when this uh, bone has completely broken and it has also rotated. We will call it as a spiral fracture. And again compound fracture when they are communicating with the outside skin we are using the term compound fracture. So, fracture healing or bone fracture healing can is very similar to the uh, wound healing of the skin. So, over here also the similar concept is being applied. So, what is very important, there are two types of fracture healing of the bone. One is your primary union, another one is your secondary union. The more common variety is the one which is taking place by secondary union and you are supposed to write this in the exam. So, what is the primary union, uh, you know, bone fracture healing by primary union? This uh, type of union occurs when the fractured ends are approximated by surgical procedure. So, here bony union takes place with formation of medullary callus, okay, without periosteal callus formation. So, there is no periosteal callus formation over here. The patients can be made ambulatory early, but there is more extensive bone necrosis and slower healing in case of primary union. Now, healing of fractures by secondary union is the most common form of fracture healing. It occurs when the plaster casts are applied for immobilization of a fracture. Now, what are the steps of fracture healing in the secondary union? That is, number one, there is a pro-callus formation also called as a soft tissue callus. That is fol followed by osseous or bony callus formation which begins at the second week and is complete by the third week. And lastly, we are having remodeling of the bone. Okay, we are having the remodeling of the bone. 
So let us see the first step that is the formation of the pro callus or the soft callus formation. So the first step, there are many steps like hematoma formation, local inflammatory response, in growth of granulation tissue, role of growth factors and formation of the soft tissue callus or the pro callus. Okay. So very importantly over here, we are going to understand that the soft tissue callus formation, basically it begins with the hematoma formation. That is the first important step. So immediately after the fracture has occurred, okay, immediately after the fracture, there is the rupture of blood vessels and that leads to the formation of an organized hematoma. So a hematoma is formed as we can appreciate. This hematoma formation actually is, is going to form a clot which is providing fibrin meshwork that will seal the fracture site. So this fracture site has been completely sealed by this clot and therefore this is also providing a framework for repair to occur. Repair means it is it is allowing a framework for the inflammatory cell infiltration, for fibroblast growth in the area, for capillary formation so that the further healing process and granulation tissue formation can occur. So the first step is the hematoma formation which is providing a framework or it is providing a basic scaffolding for the repair process to occur and this happens in 0 to 1 day. An organized hematoma is formed. The second important thing as you can appreciate is the local inflammatory response. So in the local inflammatory response, so the inflammatory cells, okay, they are going to enter this site of inflammation, okay. So polymorphs and macrophages, they, they enter and the macrophages, they start to clear away the fibrin, the RBC and the debris. So whatever dead debris is there, that is basically started to be, be, uh, be cleared by the macrophages. So both the polymorphs along with the macrophages, they enter the particular, uh, 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 you know, site of fracture. Okay, so this is a local inflammatory response. Now, once the local inflammatory response occurs, that is followed by ingrowth of granulation tissue. Now, as the, the repair process is going to start, they will require nutrients. So, there is a neovascularization, leaky new blood vessels are formed. There is a proliferation of the mesenchymal cells, that is, the, there will be fibroblast proliferation. And these mesenchymal cells proliferate from the periosteum as well as from the endosteum. So, both from the periosteum and the endosteum, uh, you know, the cells are going to, you know, migrate to the site of fracture and they are going to start to proliferate, okay. Now, then comes the role of growth factors. Now, all these cells that comes, okay, all the inflammatory cells and the platelets that is present, they cause release of platelet derived growth factor, TGF beta, fibroblast growth factor. These are released from the platelets and the inflammatory cells. So, at the site, we have the presence of the platelets and we have the presence of the inflammatory cells. So, both of them are releasing a plethora of growth factors like the PDGF, TGF beta and the fibroblast growth factor. Now, what do they do? They stimulate the osteoprogenitor cells which are present in the periosteum, in the medullary cavity and surrounding soft tissues. So, what happens that over here, this is the periosteum. Okay. For example, there's an endosteal layer and for example, whatever connective tissue is there. So, the progenitor cells, they are basically mobilized by these growth factors. Okay. So, the progenitor cells, they are basically the osteoprogenitor cells, they are mobilized. And once this osteoprogenitor cells, they are activated, they are going to stimulate the osteoclastic along with osteoblastic activity because for repair process, what do we require? For repair process, we require cement and that cement for the bone is nothing but the osteoid and that osteoid is going to come from where? From the osteoblast. So, this osteoprogenitor cells, they are going to activate the osteoblast along with the osteoclast. Now, why do I require osteoclast? Because for example, this is the gap that is that has to be filled with the osteoid. So, this extra amount of bone that is that has been laid down, this has to be removed. So, we require both osteoclastic as well as osteoblastic activity. So, osteoclast will start its resorption and osteoblast will actively proliferate and they will lay down the osteoid. So, as to start the repair healing process. Okay. Now, ultimately an uncalcified tissue known as a soft tissue callus or a pro callus is formed. And this procallus that is formed initially, they are providing some anchorage, but they do not provide structural rigidity for weight bearing. That is not provided. Okay. So, this is the initial soft tissue or the procallus formation, which is basically formed by the end of two weeks. So, in zero to two weeks of time, we are having the soft callus formation as we can appreciate. So, that is the first step that is the procallus or the soft callus formation characterized by hematoma formation number one, local inflammatory response in growth of granulation tissue, role of the growth factors, starting of the activity of the osteoclast and the osteoblast. Ultimately, a soft tissue callus is formed, which is uh, providing some anchorage, but they do not provide the structural rigidity required for weight bearing. The second important step in fracture healing that occurs or that comes is the bony callus formation. 
so within the two weeks of injury within two weeks of injury so in zero to two weeks okay soft callus was formed now from the second week to the third week what is going to happen the bony callus formation is going to start so let us try and understand so within two weeks of injury the activated osteoprogenitor cells from the periosteum okay they deposit sub periosteal trabeculae of woven bone so at the beginning at the beginning that is in the second week the, the the bone that is being laid down that is the woven bone now if you remember woven bone is haphazardly arranged bone they are having haphazardly arranged collagen okay and they are immature bones if you see over here okay this is basically the fracture end okay this is the fracture end okay if you can appreciate this normal bone above they are in lamella okay they are organized this is a lamellar bone Whereas over here, some new woven bone, which is having haphazardly arranged, you know, haphazardly arranged uh, collagen fibers are there. So they are, you know, laid down first. So at the end of second week, when the bony callus just begins to form, initially we are having the woven bone, which is laid down perpendicular to the long axis of the cortex and in the medullary cavity. Okay. And over a period of one week from the second to the third week, what is going to happen? This woven bone is going to be come, you know, uh, is going to be replaced by lamellar bone by the end of third week. Okay. Now, not only uh, uh, there is formation of osteoid or the wo woven bone, but there is also activation of soft tissue mesenchymal cells, which differentiates to form chondrocytes, which will give rise to fibrocartilage as well as hyaline cartilage, which is itself going to undergo endchondral ossification and give rise to contiguous layer or network of bone formation, not only at the periosteal region, it is going to start from the periosteum and as well as in the medulla, this is going to occur. So some amount of mesenchymal stem cell, they are also giving rise to hyaline and fibrocartilage, which is going to undergo endchondral ossification is going to occur over here, which will again form bone. And this process is taking place. This is the periosteal site as well as inside the medullary cavity also you will see this change that is going to occur so ultimately the net result is that there will be solid bone formation not only in the medulla but also from the periosteum and this will ultimately give rise to what is called as a bony callus okay so what happens that because of this formation of the bone the fractured bone ends are bridged and with progressive mineralization the callus allows the weight bearing and ultimately a mature bony callus is formed as we can appreciate in this particular diagram okay now from three weeks okay to several months old so whatever woven bone that we were having that is now replaced completely by the lamellar bone that is completely replaced by the lamellar for example this was the site of fracture okay now over here first woven bone came then some cartilage came then they were uh, you know, the, the cartilage undergoed end chondral ossification was there, ultimately mineralization was there and then they gave rise to lamellar bone. So, lamellar bone replaced the woven bone, okay. So, after three weeks to three months, okay, the bony callus is comprising entirely of the lamellar bone, okay, of the lamellar bone, okay. The third important step is the remodeling. As I told you, for example, for example, excess amount of bone is formed in these areas, which is not required, for example. So, this excess amount of bone that is formed, they have to be removed and this is basically requiring osteoclastic activity. So, remodeling is using both osteoclastic along with osteoblastic activity. Now, in the early stages of callus formation, what is happening? Excessive amount of fibrous tissue, excessive amount of cartilage, excessive amount of bone is formed. As I told you at the beginning in the second week, okay just at the start of the bony callus formation you are having increased amount of fibrous tissue cartilage and woven bone uh, production now portions that are not subjected to physical stress they are resolved as the callus mature so those part of the bony callus okay which is not receiving any kind of weight bearing or which is not subjected to any kind of physical stress that means that part is not required so that part is resolved okay as the callus is going to remodel or mature now, the importance of this remodeling is that it reduces the size of the healing bone and recreated lamellar bone. So, it is reducing the size of the healing bone and it recreates a lamellar bone. Proper lamellar bone is created okay, by remodeling. Healing process becomes complete by restoration of the medullary cavity. This is the end point of healing when the entire medullary cavity is restored. Okay, When this medullary cavity that you see that is being restored then that is the end point of remodeling. Now, remember one thing that one thing that is also given in some other books, but it is not given in Robbins. They say 
at the soft tissue callus they are of three important you know they are formed at three parts one is an external soft callus one is intermediate soft callus one is internal soft callus so the external soft callus is completely resorbed the intermediate soft callus okay they basically give rise to compact or cortical bone whereas the internal callus they form the marrow cavity so if some mcqs are formed in this particular you know in in this way you can answer this question now what are what are the complications of fracture healing number 1 fibrous union so it may result instead of osseous union if immobilization of fractured bone is not done properly non union again occurs either due to inadequate immobilization or if some soft tissue is interposed between the fractured end so the bone might not join at all now sometimes if non union is going to persist then the callus might undergo cystic degeneration and the luminal surface of the callus will become lined by synovial like cells this is going to give rise to false joint or pseudo arthrosis okay and last important complication is delayed union it occurs because of again inadequate immobilization infection inadequate blood supply poor nutrition old age or movement so with this we have completed the entire uh, uh, long answer question that is fracture healing in details thank you very much for watching this particular video